thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's been an honor for me to be talking at this uh, consensus, uh, future consensus forum. Um, I've really been inspired by the talks today, and um, I'm happy that there's so much focus on on humans, on people, the human centered the people-centered approach as well. I'm an anthropologist from the University of Copenhagen, and so, so I study humans, I work with humans and cultures, so this is really great uh, to hear. Um, so my talk um, is entitled Interdisciplinary Collaboration and Learning with Labs. And from Michael's great talk on meter structures, I will dig into the everyday life in smart cities. So I'll try to be very concrete because smart cities and the development of smart cities is also something practical and very concrete. It's difficult, I think. We know that. And also from the forecasting of the future, yes, I'll go to more like, practical ways of working today. Um, it's part of a larger EU funded smart cities uh, project called Smart Cities Accelerator. I'm uh, responsible for the social scientific part uh, in Greater Copenhagen. Greater Copenhagen is both the city of Copenhagen, the region of Ursula, and also some parts of Sweden. I will mostly focus on um, Copenhagen, cases in Copenhagen, in and around Copenhagen. Yeah. Um, so just to, to, to give you a, a little quick uh, 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 introduction to the, to the project, this is a Canadian research and innovation project where we aim for the optimization of life, uh, the quality of life, as I mentioned before, in buildings, organizations, uh, cities, using new technologies, data. And when I talk about data, it's both uh, big data, quantitative data, but also qualitative data. And I'll be back. I'll come back to that during this talk. Um, and it's also about to, or we also want to increase renewable energy in uh, public buildings and city infrastructures. And um, I want to em emphasize from the beginning, and, and this is a collaboration, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaboration. Of course, interdisciplinarity is a buzzword, but and it's difficult to do. But I think it's so important that we go together uh, to solve these very com complex issues uh, uh, from different disciplines. From different with different answers. So we we could collaborate in the project between data scientists, building engineers uh, from the Technical University of Denmark, and also legal um, legal um, scientists, social scientists from the University of Copenhagen, and also employees and managers from the cities and the uh, municipalities in the area. So, um, in that sense, we try to merge these so-called hard and soft approaches, which has been, yeah, as, as Professor Lee also mentioned before, there's a lot of focus on technology, on economy, and I actually see a lot of this still in the municipalities, as well in the cities, that prioritize the Of course, these things are essential, pivotal in the development of our societies, but we also need to as, as we have talked about today, to involve other parameters, the social, the cultural, the educational parts as well. So we take this more holistic approach in order to understand and accelerate sustainable urban development. Um, so I have two very concrete cases uh, with me today. Um, the one, the first is, is more uh, stuff. It's, this project is still ongoing, so it's not, it's not the final. Uh, Results. Um, the first is I've mentioned uh, called the smart people in the smart buildings, and um, uh, it's about, as I mentioned before, to optimize life in buildings and cities using technologies and different kind of data. And actually, here in this in this SOC pro uh, project, within the overall project, we uh, try to improve indoor climate in prim primary schools. In Hotel, is a uh, small uh, community within uh, in Greater Copenhagen. And as mentioned, we use both these uh, positive data collection, different sensors, you know, isometers, where we collect data on, on temperature, on C2 levels, on humidity, on uh, noise levels as well. And also the positive field and the field work. Uh, 
I'm in charge of that. Where we go into the schools, we go into the municipalities uh, to study the users or the people in the buildings, in the organizations, uh, the teachers, pupils, uh, staff, in order to, to, yeah, to explore the social and organizational services as well. We try to connect so, very briefly, some of the findings that we have is that, first of all, the technical part, uh, the levels of students in two are unacceptable high. And this is, of course, not a good thing in schools. It's not good in any location, especially in schools, because high levels of C2 creates headache, lack of concentration. And this is not a good in a learning environment. So the, and this is not only for the few schools that we've studied in the Greater Copenhagen area, this is a national problem in Denmark, and I think also in other countries. So that's a huge problem that we need to address. Um, furthermore, when we talk about the indoor climate, and when we talk about good indoor climate, it's actually sometimes difficult to define, okay, then what is the good indoor climate? Because there's so many different perceptions, ideas of what is the good indoor climate. One example, if you are in the classroom, the, the, the pupils, they, in the break, they go out and they play uh, soccer, or they run around while the, the teacher perhaps is in the staff room drinking coffee or tea and comes back. And the, the, students, the students come back into the, the classroom and they feel it's very warm. And then they want to open the window. And of course, the teacher comes back and they have a totally different perception, perception of, of the temperature, of the indoor climate in the classroom. So it's a, it's, it's, a negotiation. it's being negotiated between the users, between the people in the, uh, in, in, in the classroom. What then is the good indoor climate? So it's a subjective and situational matter. Uh, another example is also from one of the schools that we've seen. It's actually that these negotiations of the good indoor climate has caused or affected frictions in the working environment. Because the teachers have been, uh, have been complaining about bad indoor climate or, or bad air quality, while the, the, uh, the staff responsible for the buildings and the indoor climate had another perception. So they came into the, to, to the, to the, to the rooms and uh, they did, did not feel that the indoor climate was that bad. And again, there was these contradictions and frictions going on in the everyday life of the school because they had not uh, yeah, a, a concrete perception of the indoor climate. So, so in this sense, it's social. There is diverse experiences that are negotiated in day life, but it's also an organizational thing. We want to understand indoor climate. Uh, the good indoor climate depends on organizational positions and interests. So we have these challenges. We have these challenges from some of our findings. Uh, first of all, high concentrations of CO2, bad air, bad concentration, bad learning conditions. We also have these negotiations because of the frictions and this challenge to work in environment as mentioned. So the indoor climate became becomes a political thing. So um, we needed to go together with uh, some of the people in this and also with the researchers at the ITU to, 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 to see how could we then optimize the situation. And we wanted to make, and this is not rocket science, this is a very practical, low, low, yeah, very minor. Yeah, everyday life problems. We need to, to make these complex situations simplistic for the users, for the people and the good. So to make the indoor climate more tangible, concrete for the involved actors. To ensure clarity, overview of what we call the shared signifier. To build a framework where we visualize real dark time data of, again, the indoor climate. Um, and this is this is pretty simple. So for me, it's, it's there's a lot of very very uh, yeah complex uh, uh, digital systems etc. They are important, but if we want to involve citizens, the people, we also need to make them simple so they can use the different technologies, the different digital platforms. So here's here the the, the, the users of the buildings they can just follow. 
the indoor climate on the different levels, if it's good or if it's okay or if it's, if it's bad. And uh, by this, we hope that, first of all, that the service management cost effectively can target improvements to certain rooms instead of making uh, improvements in all the, in all the buildings so we can see where is the problem. Teachers, pupils can have an opportunity to open the window if, if the C2 level is to hide a notification. Do something by the times. The politicians also get some data, but not kind of complex set of data. They need something which they can use for their decision. So we try to make it very concrete and essentially very simple. Uh, and furthermore, we also want to incorporate this in the teaching. So actually, this data and this visualization of the everyday life in the school, the students can use them in different learning activities. So they also learn about data and, and, and technology. So we try to, to make it clear for, 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 for the people. So uh, the second case that I want to present is, uh, is mostly on the methodological part, because we're not that far yet. But we want to, as mentioned as well, to increase renewable energy in public buildings and city infrastructures. And our question is, how might um, uh, future consumer-centric electricity markets work? And um, we have formed different experiments in living labs in Norham, which is a part of, of, of Copenhagen, where there's a new neighborhood, so it's, uh, there's a lot of technology is built into the, to, 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 to the buildings, to the, to the homes. And here we, um, my, my group, we explore how citizens might be or might not be motivated to share uh, energy in peer to peer communities become so, so called consumers. But it's not in, in where we are now, for me, it's not important that they have to become consumers. It's important to understand the different motivational factors in order to, uh, to, to ensure the best possible solutions for them if they were. So we study how people in smart buildings could use, for example, blockchain technologies, which are developed from, from the DTU, from the Technical University of Denmark, uh, uh, to share this renewable energy in, in a closed system. Um, so very briefly, we have, of course, the quantitative data and the technology. We also have this, I think this is, um, this is not something we see everywhere. We have this design of logical approach where we as researchers do go nature, so we go into the, the homes of the people. Of course we involve them also, but we talk to them to participatory representation in the local community. We study the organization, organizational circumstances, and we try to, yeah, with our data, to go design new uh, scenarios for future consumer centric electricity markets. Uh, so, and these workshops that we have are extremely important and where we involve, as mentioned, both citizens, employees, and also and also different kinds of researchers. Um, now, conducting research in such interdisciplinary living labs is not easy. <laughs> um, because, well, I can give you a couple of examples because the research subjects, in some in some sense, have agents. They can all they are involved in the studies. So one example is one of the schools. So when the people from the municipality, the owners of the building, they saw that the C2 levels were too high during our baseline studies, they ran out to the school and began to make improvements during our studies. So actually during the project. Um, they made some kind of yeah, interventions, and this was, uh, we were not sure if this was good or bad because it was not really good for our research, but it was good for the school. So, so the, these kind of pre impacts happened. That was a constructive development. It could also be disruptive because, uh, also in the same project, the uh, the municipality the managers in the municipality actually closed because of these. Levels, high levels of C2 closed down the sharing of data with the pupils and the teachers during our project. So that was what I would call the destructive pre impact 
on this living now. Because you know, when we do our studies in these kind of situations in real life, uh, these people uh, yeah, spontaneously, strategically add on experimental actions and results. And this is, yeah, this is something that we have to consider as a research. So these reactive interventions occur during scientific studies and in pre-impacts influence the researchers through investigation and data production. And I'm not sure we can discuss this, but I do not see this as contaminating interruption, but actually as fundamental conditions when con con conducting research in this kind of uh, these kind of living labs. And it also questions a more instrumental idea of impact as something which comes after the project is something that happens during the collaboration, all the time during, during our, our studies. So to to um, to wrap it up, I'll just um, yeah say that, that, that we've heard a lot of systemic or overall approaches, and these are of course very important. But we take a more interdisciplinary, microsocial position involving citizens, researchers, organizations in, in the urban development, and uh, yeah, we intertwine these different adverse parameters, technical, social, political, organizational circumstances. And yeah, we hope that this opens up for new potential to understanding and holistic solutions for all sustainable development.